Um, but yeah, the uh, timer is up. So this is what we're going to read on Philosophy Roulette. This is called Philosophical Games by uh, Stefano Gualeni. Um, and this is in the Encyclopedia of Ludic Terms. So this is a paper written for an encyclopedia about games. But games is a big topic in philosophy. So if you... Um, what's it called? Like if you go to the uh, Stanford... Oh, let me just... Plato... God damn it. Plato.stanford.edu, you do uh, games. And so you're going to see that, like, this, and anyone who doesn't know, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is like the standard text. If you are a philosopher or you're interested in philosophy and you have some sophistication, this is not written at the most, like, basic level. You have to actually know something, or else it'll be very hard. But, like, that's okay. It'll take a little bit of work, but there's a lot of stuff here. There is a a lot of and it's written by philosophers like professional researchers for the public this is the first collaboratively edited online encyclopedia predates wikipedia so like the first entry here is logic and games like so this is revised on the uh, 2019 this recent article and i mean this is just huge it's like huge amount of literature just on logic and games and then we've got logic for analyzing games and we have another major article on like how we like game theory things in logic and then you, you can go to reasoning power games full abstraction full completeness game theory so this is um like if you want to check out like it is a big topic in philosophy the philosophy of games and how to analyze them so it may not sound like it but logic i mean is my area logic in games has a long history and one of the things of note actually is that lewis carroll author of alice in wonderland was a philosophical logician and he actually developed games for teaching uh logic so he was like making up like a like kind of like card games or like they're like these squares and you like you know like a board game that would teach you introduction to like basic logic and so this is a like a very you know that was uh, at the beginning of the 1900s but like this is a contemporary thing where people were you know venn diagrams you make a game you make it sort of an interactive thing where you are trying to figure out the results of some situation you're in and you get the logical consequences out by playing moves in the game so yeah okay so we're gonna read this and so this is like i said this is the encyclopedia of ludic terms this is an encyclopedia more about games than philosophy but i assume i don't know who this uh, giuliano is but you can see they put it into um yeah so university of malta so they're a philosopher um it looks like yeah, so we've got, they've, yeah, so this is a professional philosopher who works in this area. Um, so that is, uh, so we're going to read their article on philosophy of games. Here we go. And as always, feel free to ask me questions along the way. Malta is full of gambling companies. I didn't think of that. And, you know, that would make sense that someone interested in the philosophy of games might go to a place with casinos. And there's a lot of lottery shops on every street. Yeah. I mean, that's how laws go. I mean, like, Malta is a gambling area. But, like, you know, this is, like, so this is the place to be if you're interested in gaming, in some sense, where you're going to be gambling, betting, and doing different stuff. There's all the online casinos. Yeah, they're, like, based in Malta. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 no. So, I didn't think of that. It's a great point, DCI. Okie doke. So, here we go. And, as always... I am gamifying this website, so you're going to get to rate uh, the paper at the end, and then you'll be able to get things by, like, you know, participating in the website, and we get to, you know, do our emote review. So that'll be up eventually. Uh, Inspector says, driving on the I-80 through Nevada is so weird. Everything is a casino in that state. Yeah. Is Nevada a real place? No. Nevada is not a real place, but you can drive on the I-80 through it, but it's not real. Okay, philosophical games are games designed to invite players to think philosophically within and about their game worlds. They are interactive fictions allowing players to engage with philosophical themes in ways that are off that often set them apart from non-interactive kinds of speculative fictions, such as philosophical novels or thought experiments. Yeah, so this is the uh, interactive is the thing. Interactive fictions where you have to make decisions. And like I said earlier, I was just in Professor Ashley's stream who does teaches game design 
in Utah, which is right next to Nevada. So it's like this is a active area of research. Review 100 papers and you get an invisible sticker. Vipers, that's like exactly. You're going to get a, a an, an icon on the website. You're literally going to get an, uh, not an invisible sticker. You're going to get like a, like a you know, a star or something. Like, you know, how you have your little sword there. Like other people do that. What's up, what's up Adele Cosmo? I hope you're having a good day. Um, yeah, we're going to read a game about uh, games. <laughs> a paper about games. So very much you're getting in actual virtual on the website sticker for your continued reviewing uh, on philosophy roulette. <laughs> yeah, so this is like things I have to code. Frank says, but the 100 review sticker is the golden turd, so you were pressured to review 100 more to change your icon. Yeah, um, this is part of the difficulty. Like, how many wisdom points are you going to get? Um, I was thinking, like, are they going to be wisdom points? Uh, steps to enlightenment. So you might get, like, steps to enlightenment. You might get, just get grains of sand um, and that eventually turn into a heap. Uh, so these are all just very silly things that, like, if you have a few, you might get a few grains of sand, a mini heap or something, like some jokey uh, stuff. But then, like, if you keep building it up, then, yeah, you're going to have, like, you know, 100,000 steps to enlightenment, and then I'll, you'll get a better uh, icon next to your name. Socrates once got drunk and was way to break me out of uh, incarceration, or was it Plato? One of them. Hey, that's kind of cool. I mean, that they were coming, like, to help you. That's neat. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Socrates seems more, Plato was kind of, well, he was really strong. That's why he was Plato. It meant like broad chested. Um, Socrates, he might've done it. I don't know. <laughs> on, a, on Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Yeah. I don't know. I didn't play that, but yeah, maybe Socrates would end up in deep thought on the way and would be extremely late. Well, I mean, it happens. Sorry. Okay, but yes, to better understand philosophical games, this entry proposes to distinguish two primary ways in which a philosophical game can approach its themes dialectically or rhetorically. Rhetor 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 rhetorically. God, I can't speak anymore. Yeah, rhetorically or dialectically. Okay, so here we go. Philosophical games are games designed to invite players to think philosophically and... Uh, within and about their game worlds. They are interactive fictions allowing players to engage with philosophical themes in ways that often set them apart from non-interactive kinds of speculative fiction, such as philosophical novels or thought experiments. DC says there's mentions of him just stopping randomly and going into deep thought and turning up at parties late because of it and people just leaving him to it. He also never wore shoes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was always the joke of the philosophers, that they had lost their heads in the clouds. I mean, the joke about Thales was that he was, like, you know, looking up and he fell into a well or whatever because he was just, like, wandering around. Stuff like that. Um, nothing new. I just think that's slander against philosophers and you should all be ashamed of yourselves for uh, perpetuating such harmful myths against philosophers um, that were bums, and it's kind of true. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fictional content has historically been an important component of how philosophical knowledge has been developed and communicated. Yes, we're all ducks. Uh, it is, its use is particularly noteworthy in thought experiments and fictional cases. For example, very, sim very, very similar, very similar, or verisimilitude scenarios. Never use this word, very similar. Uh, used to exemplify or disprove certain hypotheses. Yeah. This is Helen de Cruz right here. Yeah. Uh, she has cancer. We were looking at that. I think she's still uh, active on Twitter, so she can't be too sick. So we wish her well. Um, anyway, within the wider horizon of fictions with philosophical scopes and aspirations, games and digital games can be recognized as having unique possibilities that are afforded by their interactivity, replayability, and completeness. With the objective of framing the philosophical use and the speculative potential of games, this entry builds on the theoretical premise that the playful... Again, what we we're talking about uh, today, experiential worlds disclosed by games and digital games are, at least to a degree, fictional. This entry acknowledges that there are games like Sudoku or Checkers and digital games such as Tetris that are not commonly discussed in the academic uh, field of game studies as fictions. Yeah, so puzzle games are somehow separate sometimes, but that is a good question because I have a history with Minesweeper. I do. 
<laughs> For the sake of brevity and focus, however, I will not elaborate on this issue and only reference games that can rather uncontroversially be considered works of fiction. Philosophers of fiction understand fictionality as a quality of representational content. To identify representational content as fictional indicates that it is meant to be imagined and not to be believed to be true. Yeah, so I mean like a movie. You don't actually think the uh, guy is going to kill you in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre or else you'd get up and leave the theater. Consequently, an expressive artifact can be considered a work of fiction when it encourages and supports imaginative acts in its audience. All cause says, I ran into a philosopher doing an open paid engagement class at a local Barnes & Noble. They were discussing the existential realism of identified game worlds as their reality. I blank, I blank stared my way out. Yeah, that's not actually, I mean, that is probably the right move on your part. Talking about like fictional reality in a meet and greet is probably not the good idea that that philosopher thought it was. I tend to not mention I do any philosophy when I meet people, and uh, I think it's a much better strategy. I actually was, um, when I was at my, I was in Stye Town in New York, they had a big sale. They have a big sale like every six months where all, cause it's a giant housing complex in Manhattan and everyone comes out and, you know, sells all their, you know, their stuff that they want to sell. And I've gone to this many times and like a family friend, I've met this lady, Miriam, the uh, friend of my friend many times and only this time. And this is like, I'm not talking like a few times we're talking. I've met her many times over the years. Because I've known this guy for, you know, decade or something. I've met her many times. <laughs> she was like, oh, wait, you, you write philosophy? I'm like, yeah. So it's been like seven years of her knowing me. She never had any idea. I'm like, I write philosophy. I was like, no, I have a job at the zoo. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I do. I had a job at the zoo at the time. But yeah. So hard to play evil in BG3. Empathize and morals keep me uh, every time. What's Baldur's Gate 3? Yeah, sequel to BG2 and prequel BG4. Yeah, so it's like people wanted to hear about like other things. I don't talk about philosophy. So. All right. Consequently, an expressive artifact can be considered a work of fiction when it encourages and supports imaginative acts in its audience. For example, readers, players, moviegoers, or radio drama listeners, and so on, whatevers. Within long-standing, longer-standing forms of fiction, such as literature or film, some works are widely considered as having philosophical significance. Think, for example, of novels such as Ursula K. Le Guin's 1974, The Disposed Films, <laughs> this is the claim BG3, the prequel of BG4 fiction. Uh, would It would have to be false for it to be fiction. But as of now, it's like unrealized. So it could be, yeah. So it depends, I guess, on what your feelings are about the future, Frank. Yeah. Uh, think, for example, of novels such as Ursula K. Le Guin's 1974, The Dis Dispossessed, or films such as Richard Linklater's 2001 Waking Life. Yeah, false at T1. Mm -hmm. They're being considered philosophical fictions can be attributed to both the central role that the philosophical ideas and questions have in their plots, uh, and perhaps even more importantly, to their functioning as philosophical tools that is in their leveraging hypothetical, often unfamiliar or paradoxical scenarios to stimulate our intuition, triggered, trigger our critical... Yeah, trigger our critical faculties and invite us to evaluate alternative possibilities for thinking and being. Now we see to do with our philosophical shit than actual shit? Yeah. <laughs> On these premises, I mean, BG3 has been very popular, so it's like... So, uh, yeah, I don't know. But like, that's part of the issue. You say it's hard to be evil in BG3. The game could let you be evil. There are important games where you can be evil. And like, you know, there was a game when I was like much younger called Black and White where you could be like an evil god or a good god. And if you were a good god, people would pray to you and like you, would you know, gain power. But you could be an evil god and like people would like their suffering would give you more power. And so like that was the uh, sort of the game. So just because Baldur's Gate doesn't let you or you feel bad or whatever, that doesn't mean other games are all like that. Yeah. On these premises, this entry identifies some 
Yeah, the games you like, yeah. The, the, identify some games as philosophical fictions. As such, their game worlds are approached as having been deliberately designed to invite players to think philosophically with and about them. The next sections of this entry will discuss the potential of games as philosophical tools and how those games' w ways of framing ideas and questions set them apart from other forms of philosophical fiction. With these intentions in mind, when examining philosophical games, I will not consider games and digital games that simply reference or allude to philosophers and philosophical ideas. I will instead discuss games that any sufficiently informed player would be able to recognize as inviting and active and playful engagement with philosophical themes. Uh, reject black and white for Greyo, yes. A game that rewards players from memorizing facts and ideas concerning philosophers is not going to be discussed here as a philosophical game. As such, a game does not require its players to think and to act philosophically in relation to its game world. This hypothetical game world, I argue, uh, would be better understood as an educational game whose didactical aim concerns the history of philosophy. To put it simply, the interactive representation of Socrates as a non-player character in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, as was just mentioned in chat, is not the kind of cultural phenomenon that will be addressed here, whereas the argumentation of the illusion of free will that is playfully disclo disclosed by the Stanley Parable is. Embrace only Periwinkle Red. What's Periwinkle, Periwinkle Red? It all costs money. Philosophical Themes the question concerning the disciplinary boundaries and aspirations of philosophical inquiry is the subject of millennia-long debates, unfortunately, yes. Because of the great variety of its traditions and currents, uh, and due to the discipline's inextra inextricable involvement with historical and so socio-technical processes, questions like what is philosophy or what is philosophy about are impossible to answer in ways that are brief and uncontroversial. A color name that you just made up, okay. Yeah, so an there are, now here's a question for you. Is it a new color? Is it an impossible color? Is it a color that is possible that no one's ever seen before? Or, yeah, so you think it does, well, what kind of color is it? Because people actually discuss this. Could there be colors that we've never seen before? Or Because, like, there's so many colors that maybe we've just never seen it before. Or is it, like, an impossible color? Like, something, in, like, in between two colors that we can't quite see? But, like, this actually gets complicated. People talk about this. And there are people out there with an extra cone in their eye. And they can see more colors than the rest of us by some astronomical number. Because it goes up, like, uh, like exponentially. So, it's just like periwinkle red. I should have figured it out, Frank. I'm sorry. You're right. Um, <clears throat> but, like, uh, you can look it up. There's a cool article from a few years back, and I uh, thought I'd reference it once. But um, they realized that a person like this could exist with an extra cone in their eye and have seen more colors. And they found one. It took a while. But they gave a lot of tests. I think this was in England or Great Britain somewhere. They tested a lot of people, and there was a lady who actually could uh, reliably tell color differences that they could represent on a high-quality computer screen, but, like, other people couldn't see. So the lady, they'd be, like, three colors. Which color is, like, in between these two colors? And she could pick out the one that was in between. Everyone else was guessing at random. Like, they could tell. And so, but she could tell the very, very subtle differences between the colors because she had extra, you know, biology in her eye. So, this is uh, actually can get real kind of interesting. All right, continuing. It would therefore be unwise to try and address those fundamental questions here. Anticipating that some of the readers might not have an academic training in philosophy, however, I will present a quick outline of what can generally be said considered philosophical themes. You are unfamiliar with that? Yeah, that's a, I think that's a great article. Yeah. Philosophical themes are topics of discussion that revolve around philosophical questions. To be asked and to potentially an to be potentially answered, these questions typically require a kind of rational and critical commitment that set them apart from our practical dealings with everyday life. In terms of their focal points, philosophical themes put into question shared beliefs and challenge socially established assumptions. Among themes that are commonly considered to have philosophical import are ethics, knowledge, and its validity, consciousness, the reliability of our perceptions, selfhood and personal identity, the moral status of humans and non-human creatures, and their relationships with technology. Questions emerging from some of these themes will be discussed as being purposefully raised through our engagement with philosophical games in the concluding sections of this entry. And 
if you are on Twitch, you've probably seen some games that bring up issues. And then there are definitely games that you can't watch on Twitch because they do bad things and they're against the law basically to show them and so it's like well that brings in like well are you why is it okay to kill people in a video game but you can't show other stuff and so there's a lot of these questions about what is ethical in terms of like in a video game even and that's sort of the new meta uh joke going around there where you can say oh i'm gonna kill that person and then be like in a video game and it's like you're trying to be like well it's okay to kill someone in minecraft Philosophical games. As already introduced, philosophical games are interactive fictional worlds that are designed to invite players to think philosophically within and about them. Like non-interactive forms of speculative fiction, philosophical games present fictional contents, feature narratives, narrative developments, and prescribe various acts of imagination. I do not know that game, uh, Tindarius. So I don't know what hatred is. Three interrelated traits, however, are uniquely characteristics a characteristic of interactive fiction and set the experiential worlds of games and digital games apart from other ways uh, to access fictional worlds. Um, these traits are 1. Interactivity. A feeling of presence and belonging within the fictional world of the game is primarily upheld by the possibility for the player to persistently and intelligibly interact with in-game objects, characters, and events. The manipulability and responsiveness of game worlds afford, the, afford players the possibility to make to take meaningful decisions. And this is the a big thing. I've heard Professor Ash, like I keep saying, just shout her out. Does she have a... God damn. Uh... Does she have an underscore? No, that was not it. Dag nabbit. Dismiss. All right, I have to wait a minute. Okay. But, like, this is a sort of her, one of her things I've heard from Professor Ashley, who d is, teaches game design, that video games are about bringing up meaningful decisions that you have to make. Um, so, possibility to take meaningful decisions and actions within those worlds. The fact that players' decisions and actions can be recognized as having philosophical relevance depends on the context in which they are taken and on what kind of outcomes the designers of a game planned for them. In general terms, it is quite obvious that the philosophical potential afforded emerging from the interactivity of games and digital games relies on players taking responsibility for their actions on and on accepting a game's invitation to critical reflect on those actions. Uh, Tindir says it's banned on Twitch. The player character is misanthropic mass killer referred to as the antagonist who begins a genocide crusade to kill as many human beings as possible. Yeah. So, sort of thing that um can't do on Twitch. And there is a banned list um, on Twitch that you can go find. Now, it says it's like non- like it, it's an incomplete list, but those are the ones that are known that to be banned. Like, so there was a game from my youth and it continued. It's called Leisure Suit Larry. So this guy is always just going out trying to get laid or whatever. And so there was like, there's a, it's sexually themed, but it was more of a comedy point and click back in the day. And so it was, um, yeah. It, so there's, there's things that are fucked up, like, uh, going around trying to do genocide. Then there's other times where it's just like sexually themed or whatever. And you just can't, um, I was like, you can't show that, but then there's other stuff like, well, there is, I remember there was a conference many years ago about like, where they tried to make games that you'd have to do like mean things in them. And it was like, it was weird. Larry's allowed on Twitch. Oh, okay. I, I suspect some Larry's allowed. Oh yeah. The, about the old ones. I bet the very old leisure suit one, uh, the very old ones. And what's up lumpy. Um, I don't know about the, I mean, the newer ones, they keep, they've kept making them. So I think there's some from like only a few years ago and I suspect that would get quite wrong to well, Let's see if I can. Yes. This is professor, professor Ashley. Um, yeah. So if you want to hear more about, I, I think game design is interesting. If you're on Twitch, you may have, like, you know, play games, watch a lot of games being played. So you can go talk to her about like game design. Yeah post a bit more serious the tits are so pixely that it counts as censored i guess well yeah the old ones but it, these things are relative um so i was watching something about the rating systems what was that but the idea that like cyberpunk 
with what they show in Cyberpunk got a not um, like a mature NC-17 whatever rating. Like someone got paid off to like allow that game to be widely distributed. But like, yeah. <clears throat> and then there's things in like GTA too, exactly. So it's like in the new GTA, I wonder how raunchy they're going to get. Because GTA has a history of being a little bit like, you know, pushing the boundaries of what you can do. Because, you know, it's just about robbing like doing crimes a lot of it so yeah yeah but yeah back in the day those tic those pixelated tits were like that was very wrong G, those pixels and uh yeah now it's like oh that's pixelated it doesn't matter you've been doing chore all day oh, okay well i hope your chore is now done okay replayability i don't know about replayability not all games are replayable Replayability. In-game situations can be interactively approached in a variety of ways. In most games, players have the possibility to experiment with those situations over and over again until they are satisfied with the resulting save affairs or until all possible options have been explored. Yeah, so they're save scum. You're saying you're save scum. Okay. Nearly. All right. Well, I hope you uh, get it done. Tindir says the difference in GTA is your choice to go on a nonsensical killing spree and you get punished for it in hatred. Um, it's the main goal of the game. Yeah. So, again, there's a lot of questions of focus and tone, and that's why it's hard to make, like, a blanket rule. Like, killing people clearly has to be allowed in a video game on Twitch. Killing people in a certain way, um, like in Hatred, they said that's too far. So, yeah. So, okay. So they're saying you have to be able to save your game and come back to it. It's not like a real-time thing. Yeah, this can happen over multiple playthroughs or when the game is reverted to a previously saved state. When part of the experience of gameplay, the quality of replay when part of the experience of gameplay, the quality of replayability allows players to approach in-game scenarios and challenges in a fluid and non-committal manner. That is not usually an option when those actions and decisions are taken in the actual world. Due to the replayability of games, a player is able to assess and potentially revise one's decisions and actions in light of having empirical knowledge of their outcomes. The philosophical potential of this trait thus consists in its exposing the fact that contingency is inherently inherent in any given situation and in its contributing fluidifying the ways in which players think about the present state of affairs and its possible development. Yeah. I mean... I don't know about, I'd call this replayability. I'd call this something about, um, yeah, like the fluidity of the state of affairs that you can go back in time. You all went through Postal, the pacifist didn't pee on a single thing. God. I don't know this game Postal either, but that sounds hilarious, actually, where, like, peeing on stuff is uh, a serious danger in the game. Okay. A higher degree of fictional completeness. In discussing games as forms of fiction that are more aesthetically complete than novels or movies, I am specifically referring to the fictional worlds of digital games. Aside from interactivity, another aspect is that is frequently considered to be central to one's existential and emotional engagement with a, a digital world is its aesthetic consistency. Okay, that's fair. I don't know about completeness, but consistency, yeah. Like, things in games can be way more consistent across, like, the world than our actual world is. Okay, as a consequence of the freedom afforded to their players that was discussed in the previous two points, digital games often need to offer a more complete representation of fictional objects, characters, and events than non-interactive forms of fiction do. In films and novels, the incomplete description of their fictional world can be embraced as an appeal to the appreciator's creativity and an opportunity for them to freely imagine what is not overtly represented in the work. In digital games, instead, aesthetic incompleteness is experienced as a deficiency and a limitation to players' freedom to explore and look at every nook and cranny of the game world. This is true, um, where people, if you have, like, empty spots in your game, people are like, why is there an empty spot in your game? If there's, like, stuff you can't explore in a movie, it's, well, you were not supposed to explore. Um, why do all cats go to hell cost money? Wow. All right. Well, whatever. I know the game. All right. I'm sure I've seen it, but streamer brain at the moment. <laughs> I apologize for streamer brain. It's been a long few weeks. I need to get through the end of this month. Yeah. I'll be, I think, 
less to do at the end of June, but the way things are going, I'm not gonna, I'm not banking on that, but I am expecting by the end of this month, no, after the end of this month, not by, after the end of this month, I'll have less on my mind, but we will see. There's also a movie. Okay. 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 For that reason, digital games and interactive simulations tend to disclose the aesthetically richest kind of fictional worlds. Uh, a detailed and more complete fictional representation requires more work to be developed less than a lesser defined one, but the extra effort also has its philosophical advantages. A higher degree of fictional completeness is considered to be desirable in speculative scenarios that confront their audience with moral dilemmas or discuss human emotions and motivations in context. All dogs go to heaven except those, in, those class traders in Paw Patrol. Yes, that is absolutely true. Okay, so this makes sense. Like, when you walk around a world, you can't walk around a movie. And because, like, if you were to turn the camera around a movie, you'd see the entire, you know, people filming. it. But in a video game, you turn around and you see more world. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, you can look it up. I mean, what? I mean, it's not actually uh Yeah, it's like. So, yeah. <coughs> okay. As argued above, we can understand philosophical games as granting interactive and fluid access to speculative scenarios that invite players to engage with philosophical questions and themes. In relation to those th questions and themes, some playful philosophical scenarios, again with the word playful, um, are designed to convince players of the soundness of certain observations and courses of action. Other philosophical games are instead more ambiguous and exploratory, putting the onus of determining the best course of action and the meaning of in-game decisions or lack thereof onto the players themselves. One could label this second kind of relationship between philosophical game and its players as being mainly dialectical. Following Ian Bogos, instead one might refer to the first approach as being primarily rhetorical. Yeah, so if you are in a sort of on rails they're just showing you stuff that's rhetorical if you're like interacting with the game and you have more decisions to make that's more dialectical okay in terms of the rhetorical use of philosophical games, one could, for instance, examine titles that emphasize the hopelessness and unfairness of certain socio-political arrangements second life yeah I mean that was more like an interactive sim second life can't see hatred on there anymore. Maybe they took it off. I don't know. Also, no postal. Yeah. But again, that's an incomplete list. They say that because, of course, there's always new games coming out. <clears throat> All right. Players of these kinds of dystopian games are often not provided with sufficient resources or enough chances to bring about positive changes in the game world that they fictionally inhabit. There is an evident rhetorical goal in putting players in a condition where change is impossible and a tragic conclusion is inevitable. Examples of these playable dystopian reflections on social oppression can be identified in Every Day the Same Dream or Cart Life, where players' interactions cannot prevent frustration and loss. In their arguing in favor of a certain point or perspective, rhetorical games tend to either converge towards a single conclusion, like in the cases that were just discussed, or various possible end states. When multiple end states are possible, games that take a rhetorical approach to philosophical themes present an obvious hierarchy with regard to their finales. What that means is that some of their game endings will be presented as more appropriate or valid answers to the game's philosophical questions than others. So, uh, Postal, be old, okay. Yeah, so this is uh, obviously somebody like very stylized in their apartment, very gray with a little red evil light on the uh, alarm clock. Differently from rhetorical games, philosophical games of the dialectical kind allow players to experiment with a number of possible approaches and possibilities without necessarily presenting them hierarchically. Yes, this is your Baldur's Gate 3, I guess. An example of this dialectical use of interactive fiction can be identified in Quantic Dream's 2018 action video game Detroit Become Human. Aw, oh, no one likes that game. Or in the experimental digital game Something Something Soup Something. Both games... Oh, there's Postal 4. <laughs> 
Both games appear to be designed to st uh, stimulate epistemological crises in the players, whereas the first has over 40 different endings and raises th thorny interactive questions concerning personal identity, artificial consciousness, and the moral and legal status of artificial beings. The second game shepherds the player to the unsettling conclusion that one cannot even conclusively define something as familiar as the notion of soup. Well, it's a drink. A thick liquid with croutons and flies served in a hat with a spoon. Looks good. Another distinction that proves useful in dis yeah, excuse me. Another distinction that proves useful in understanding philosophical games concerns their focus. Some games, like the already mentioned Detroit Become Human, are big productions. They are games that last for several hours and build upon an and interweave multiple themes and tropes from a variety of disciplines, philosophy, literature, law, and so on. There are philosophical games that instead focus on one theme or sometimes even on just a single question. When these smaller, usually experimental productions take on a predominantly rhetorical approach to their game, like Jesper Jules, the game of video game objects, they can be labeled as playable essays. When focused, uh, when focused philosophical games take instead of primarily dialectical stance towards their theme, we might refer to them as playable thought experiments, of which something something soup something can be considered to be a paradigmatic case. On the basis of the of the understanding of philosophical games discussed until this point and making use of the lexical terms that were just introduced, the next and conclusive section of this entry outlines a thematic taxonomy of philosophical games. Yeah, so I'm losing my voice already. A Brief Thematic Taxonomy of Philosophical Games This section briefly discusses the question and activities that, present, that presently define the philosophical use of games together with illustrative exemplary cases. Among the most common themes that can be recognized as the focus of contemporary philosophical games are ethics and morality, political dissent and social criticism, alterity and estrangement, and our very understanding of games. Allow me to insist on the fact that this is not supposed to be taken as an exhaustive list and that the individual treatment of each of those themes, which can be found below, merely serves as an introductory outline and as practical references to what is obviously a wider and more nuanced horizon of possible applications. Worthy mention among the philosophical areas that were not included here are those regarding determinism and the philosophy of religion. Ethics and Morality Philosophical games about ethics and morality typically confront the player with choices that are designed to be hard to take. What makes those situations problematic to act upon usually depends on their ambiguity and on the emotional investment of the players. Some of the ethical dilemmas presented in these games echo or even directly reference philosophical perspectives on matters such as moral responsibility. I mean, I remember the beginning of... Uh, I. Actually, I don't remember the beginning of Prey. I remember someone talking about the beginning of Prey like it literally had a trolley problem. It might help here to think of thought experiments like the trolley problem or the famous violinist and about how often interactive fictions disclose similar scenarios to the players. Yeah, so if you don't know the trolley problem or the famous violinist, let me know. But there are these famous moral uh, thought experiments. A player who is challenged to think through naughty ethical situations is act is asked to act upon them and is finally faced with their consequences in a fictional contest context undergoes experiences that have the potential to be educational and even transformative. Similar to non-interactive fictions, it can be argued that sufficiently engaging very similar philosophical games can help us cultivate and obtain a firmer grasp of theories in moral philosophy, refine our sensitivity, and, <clears throat> and help us better orient our moral compass. The famous violinist is that you wake up and you have someone attached to you. So you've got a person sort of like attached to you like kind of like a parasite but they're a really famous violinist they're like the best fucking violinist in the world and like you have to like they're like there was a terrible accident you were both there and the only way they could save the your like the other person's life was to like attach them to you and so now you have like a like they can't like unattach them or else the famous violinist will die um yeah Let's look this up real fast uh, famous, so get a, god damn it, what am I, uh, yeah, so, okay, okay, here we go, and that's what it's from, it's from this, uh, defense of abortion, 
So it's like um, you would. So yeah, and so you can see in the uh, right here. The use of someone else's body. So, yeah, that's what it, I forgot what it was about. I knew what the thought experiment was like. What do you do when you have someone else's body attacks you that you're responsible for their life now? And so people be like, all right, well, the violence that's your body, get rid of the violinist. And like, you're like, well, well, there's a baby there and they're not even a violinist. Why can't I get rid of their body now also? So that's what it is. Okay. So, continuing with this. Video game franchises such as BioWare's Mass Effect. People love that game. Like, I think I bought it because it was like a five, it was for five bucks or something uh, not long ago. Telltale's games The Walking Dead or the war survival game This War of Mine can be considered exemplary in this regard. As they famously feature a variety of morally ambiguous scenarios to act upon and often, irre and often irrevocable decisions that can lead to the death of some of the protagonists. Um, in Mass Effect, for instance, the Krogans are presently presented as a resilient and aggressively expansionist alien species known for decimating planets and reproducing at a very fast rate. As a consequence, the fictional galaxy where the game takes place is in danger of being taken over by them. In response to the Krogan spreading, another species, the Salarians, developed the Genophage, a biological device that drastically reduces the rate of birth survival in the Krogans. At a certain point in Mass Effect 3, the player character, I guess is all spoilers, I'm very sorry, the commander of the spaceship Normandy SR-1 is given the possibility to cure the genophage and stop what is effectively an ongoing Krogan genocide. The player can instead to decide to be complicit in sabotaging the cure. Sabotaging the cure that might save millions of Krogans requires, however, the murder in cold blood of the Salarian crew member of the Normandy, the scientist Morden Solis. Aw, oh, we're gonna kill Morden. The Political Dissent and Social Criticism Philosophical games about political dissent and social criticism are often the rhetor of the rhetorical kind, as they tend to be designed to unambiguously communicate the unfairness and or unsustainability of a certain political arrangement. Uh, well, the... I mean, I don't know. Are you talking about Mass Effect, or are you talking about the uh, violinist? Frank says, killing someone to stop them from genociding isn't necessarily best described as murder. Well, that's the question. So, I mean, I guess in this world, you don't like the Krogans, but they're all dying. Should you kill all these people to stop all the other people from dying? I mean, I guess it depends if you're a utilitarian or a deontologist. Deontologists be like, no, 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 no. You can no kill people for saving other people. And a utilitarian be like, yeah, well, fuck those five people. We've got millions at stake here. So, oh, yes, I have played Wolfenstein. I grew up on that. My dad was playing that when I was a kid. So, yeah, uh, Wolfenstein was like... That was like, yeah, I grew up on Wolfenstein. <laughs> like Wolfenstein, Doom, and uh, like some of uh, the old point and click games. So yeah, we were playing, uh, my dad had, like I was, we were installing like the Doom on like the three and a half inch floppies. So yeah, and Doom is uh, one of the first first person shooters. Um, where you, you run around, you're escaping a Nazi jail and you're just killing lots of Nazis. So, yep. Political dissent and so, yeah, sorry, we were here. So, yeah, unsustainable of a certain political arrangement. Some of these games have, instead of a more utopian approach and re a more utopian approach and reveal through their gameplay that the socioeconomic systems we know and live in are contingent and subject, subject to change and that fair and less oppressive alternatives are always possible. Is Chex Quest more ethical than Doom? I'm sorry, I don't know Chex Quest, so I don't know. But it sounds like you are a, you know, a shill to, like, modern capitalism. So probably not. Although I don't know what the st status of Doom is right now either. Okay. Like other philosophical fictions with similar goals, think of dystopian and utopian works of science fiction. Philosophical games of this kind can help the players per perfect their grasp of certain social and economic dynamics and can suppl uh, su supplement their political imagination. See D. Smet 2021. Games like Brenda, Rom uh, Brenda Romero's 2009 Holocaust-inspired board game Train, Lucas Pope's 2013 bu bureaucratic dystopian game Papers, Please. I always wanted to play this. Um, or uh, Mall Industria's 2016 gentrification simulation Nova, Nova Alea are widely considered to be successful examples of this use of games. It's Doom but kid friendly. Um, Papers Please is fun, yeah. 
Uh, Check was more ethical than Doom. I mean, if you are a religious person, then I'd say no, because in Doom, you're like, and also this is a something funny about Diablo. You're killing the demons of hell. You are like saving humanity. So I would say Doom is definitely more ethical than some lame kids game. Um, because you are actually saving us from like terrible, terrible destruction. That would be the ethical game. Now, is it age appropriate? No, but it's probably more ethical. What are you doing that's like morally good in Chex Quest? In Doom or like Diablo, you are literally saving the humans from like the swarm of hell beasts. You should call it papers, please, and still call it philosophy content. Yeah. <clears throat> you like Dungeon Keeper, where you keep protecting your dungeon against the heroes? Yeah, so. I mean, that's a nice reversal. Like, I, there was a fun little fiction on Reddit, like some writing prompt, where, you know, the evil people took over, and it turns out there were way better managers, treated their, like, the people that were enslaved by them way better than, like, they had been under sort of, like, the medieval king in the fantasy world. And it was really funny, because it was just like, once you figured out what the evil overlord wanted, it wasn't that onerous, and you were kind of, like, having a much nicer life even though everything like was evil looking and they asked for some weird stuff, it was never actually that bad. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> evil is your favorite. You're literally trying to destroy the world. Well, you know, fun game. Inspector says you're, oh, you're teleporting slime monsters back to their home planet. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I mean, I guess if you're teleporting slime ma monsters back to their home planet, I mean, if you're just helping them get home, that sounds like a nice thing. Frank says, I want a more complicated tower defense unless kickstarting your dungeon each time. Yeah. Yeah, you know. Yeah, like, what game actually, like, scratches, like, the, you know, the itch for you? It's hard to find. Like, I played a shit ton of Diablo 2. But, like, I that dropped off at a certain point. I played a little bit of uh, Path of Exile, but that didn't keep up. And then I haven't really played any other game other than Minesweeper, which I've always played uh, since then. Yep. Okay. The political issues addressed by philosophical games are, however, not limited to interactively identifying the inadequacy, inadequacies or the utopian possibilities of society-wide systems. Some games with critical intents directed towards society and political co and pol politics concentrate their attention on the oppressing effects of those customs and institutions that and into uh, institutions have at the scale of the individual human being this kind of philosophical game focuses on the personal and often mundane cases of economic marginalization racial discrimination and gender identity games like uh, peter lewin Lea schoenfelder's 2016 perfect woman or the already mentioned retail sim cart life can be deemed emblematic in this regard yeah so i mean like the economic games um you know, uh, capitalism and stuff. Lots of capitalistic um, stuff. <clears throat> Alarity and estrangement. Digital games can also have philosophical uses that emerge from their ability to disclose extraordinary experiences for their players. The qualifier extraordinary is used here in a way that corresponds to its etymological origin, indicating something that transcends the ordinary, an experience that goes beyond one's everyday relationship with the actual world. Uh, Megacure, for example, is a forthcoming experimental puzzle platformer video game designed by Mark Tenbosch that d challenges players to actively solve puzzles in four spatial dimensions. Its gameplay is similar to that of a regular three-dimensional platformer game. By pressing a button, however, one of the dimensions of the game world can be exchanged with another spatial dimension, the fourth. This new mechanic allows players to experience moving and manipulating the game world in four dimensions and explore the various consequences of doing so. Commenting on these uh, unfamiliar experiences, game designer Jonathan Blow commented in an interview that Megacure is a valuable contribution to human experience, right? Mark's creating an experience that would not have been possible to have had he not made it. I don't know. I mean, just adding another physical dimension is interesting. Now, what would it be like for us to experience that? Eh, not entirely sure. But like, yeah, you do get a commentary on how you understand you're moving through the world when you move through a world that you like it's different, has extra dimensions then. So maybe it does get you to think about how you feel in a place, space and things like that. 
So that's an interesting thing. But there are a bunch of these games. I played something called what? Well, there's a bunch of these. Um, there's a viewfinder recently. There was um, what the hell's that other game called? I forget. But there's a, there's there's a whole bunch of uh, mind bending puzzle games. Uh, and they're a lot of fun actually. And they, but like, I feel like they're closer to the puzzle games and they're not telling us so much about, you know, this world. Anyway, it's more like Tetris. Well, uh, while Mega Cure offers a particularly focused and deliberate example of a game that asks us to transcend our customary ways of having experience of and thinking about the world, all digital game world can be recognized as disclosing points of view, perceptions, and possibilities that are unfamiliar or even incompatible with how we inhabit the actual world as biological creatures. The work of Federico Alvarez is uh, Igar, Igar Zabal uh, is useful in understanding how time is produced, perceived, and manipulated within digital game worlds, and also exposes its profound incongruence with the human experience of actual time. There can be several philosophical uses in providing players with extraordinary ways of being in the world. The experimental action-adventure video game Hairfest uh, was developed with that intention of reformulating the questions raised in Thomas Nagel's famous what, what is it like to be a bat as an interactive fiction. Hairfest allows the human player to fly around the game world with very limited eyesight by perceiving volumes via the discon discontinuous input of an echolocator system, eat moths, and hang upside down from rafters. Although its correspondence with the experience of being an actual bat is unverifiable, its game world can be understood as disclosing persistent and intersubjective experiences that were previously inaccessible to human be to human beings. Megacure and Hairfest invite the players to take a philosophical perspective on game worlds as new experiential and epistemic domains. Similar aspirations can be recognized in such types. Such titles as Valve's 2007 puzzle platformer, video game Portal, or the experimental first-person game prototype, A Slower Speed of Light. Where Portal challenges players to think to experiment with the idea that space can be interactively made discontinuous, that is tunneled through while preserving inertia of motion, and, well, they lied to us. They said we were going to get cake, so fuck those guys. A, a slower speed of light allows them to playful playfully familiarize with the experience of being affected by special relativity, what it's like to perceive and interact with the game world when moving at a speed that approaches that of light. Okay. Yeah, so... I don't know how much those games where you're really messing with the world tell you about this world, but I guess it does give you a perspective on them. That's fair. I mean, for that matter, what does Tetris tell you about it? There's something called the Tetris effect. You play enough Tetris, you start seeing like blocks in reality. So that would also get you into a level of estrangement here too, where you're starting to, um, Tetris is starting to take over your mind in the non-Tetris world. And so that is also something that's really interesting. And you can look that up, the Tetris effect. It's a new. They have a game that's called that now. Uh, um, version of Tetris, the Tetris Effect. Yeah, exploring your mind. What is the Tetris Effect? So like this. So take a look at this. If anyone is still here. So this is like an interesting thing, where it's like um. It will change the way you see the world. So even though the author wasn't talking about puzzle games, this puzzle games do affect your mind. So yeah. So you have to you have to keep this like if you play enough puzzle games, like it will it will mess with your head. Okay, is this it? Oh no, we got still a little bit more to go. A few more paragraphs. Okay, our understanding of games. Philosophical games often take games themselves as their object of interest. In other words, there are games that invite invite what is technically called meta-reflexive or self-reflective reflexive perspective. Those games are deliberately designed to materialize through their gameplay and their aesthetic qualities, critical or, and or satirical perspective on the ways in which games themselves are de designed, played, sold, manipulated, experienced, and understood as social objects. The subversion of representational and or interactive canons are common design strategies through which those kinds of philosophical games encourage players to critically question their relationship with games from a variety of perspectives. That was a long fucking sentence, author. 
In their subversive pursuit, the gameplay of meta-reflexive games often feature the overt exhibition of their own constructedness as technical artifacts. In digital games in particular, this often happens by showing players debug information, dialogues, and broken geometry, or by, or by purposefully triggering aesthetic glitches. Meta-reflexive games often disclose exper experiences that are not inherently enjoyable or, or rewarding. Many philosophical games of this kind are short-lived, unwinnable, and purposefully annoying. Another characteristic that frequently characterizes this group of philosophical games is the metafictional metafictionality of their narrative. What this means is that characters, narrators, and indications that the player receives from interfaces are interfaces are designed in ways that keep reminding players that they are playing within an artificial world. Think of the character's awareness of their own status as fictional beings or as narrating voice explicitly addressing the player as player. Examples of, of those design strategies are encountered in video game titles such as Doors, Necessary Evil, and the already mentioned Stanley Parable, or The Beginner's Guide. Frank says, interesting that two of those games were coincidentally made by someone named Gualeni. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the question is, is this a, f like, is this the uh, reference to the game or is this reference to something else they, another paper they published about the game? But like, yeah, I was wondering that too. Is this person just a game designer also in writing about things that they worked on or is, are these papers because this person works in this area and are they just referencing their old work to say if you want to read more about these games go check these articles i don't know but it seems like like if you're this it looks like the everything limited uh unlimited limited company 2015 this looks like they're referencing the video game this one gualeni et al looks like you know a paper so uh we can check the bottom yeah, see, this is the end. I'd have to go through the notes, though. Okay. It is important to insist on the fact that these games are not whimsically taking a metafictional stance and do not embrace weirdness as and unconventionality as ends in themselves. On the contrary, those games do so with an evident critical intent or an obvious satirical perspective on how games are currently made, marketed, played, and culturally valued. In the cases of games mentioned above, Necessary Evil playfully reveals the idealistic player centrism that underpins this creation of every game world. The Stanley Parable is a video game that constantly breaks the fourth wall to engage the players, reflecting on the significance, if any, of in-game agency. And The Beginner's Guide is a playable essay on the very practice of game development and on players' practices of meaning making. Yes. Yeah, so, is that it? Yeah, in the bit. Hey, let's see. Let's go see how many persons. Yeah, see, look, I think, Frank, even though you may have been being tongue-in-cheek, I think they're just talking about this article here, self-reflexive video games. So, yeah, they were just giving in, they were referencing themselves, not actually, uh, so they were, you know, pushing their own articles, not their own video games. But anyway, as always, what we do here is when we finish up reading a philosophical paper, we review it. So... Even though this was a article written for the Encyclopedia of Ludic Terms, which is a non-philosophy publication, this was written by a professional philosopher. Um, Stefano Gualeni looks like they, you know, they are a legit philosopher, and so they deserve to be reviewed just as much as anyone else. If this article um, was it just a catalog of kinds of philosophical games? I don't know. I didn't click through the link. I could do that, though. Mm, this one. Yeah. You the paper? Oh, no, not the reference. No, it was uh, talking about... um. Yeah, it was kind of a catalog. But, it, I mean, it made claims, too. Yeah, so... Okay, and this is a... Uh, Italian Journal of Game Studies. So what they were referencing here is uh, this, even though that wasn't what you're asking, but I looked it up. So these are self-reflexive video games. Um, it wasn't a catalog. It was kind of um, telling you what... I mean, yes and no. It was cataloging a lot of what goes on in philosophical video games. Uh, it wasn't arguing for any point 
explicitly, but it definitely did have a uh, perspective given to it. Um, you know, what is what are the ways in which video games can have philosophical content? What are the ways in which video games actually um, provide meaningful meaningful choices to the player? Thank you for the uh, ratings, Tinderos and Vipers. Yeah, so a little bit of meh. And I think that's fair. This is a, an encyclopedia article. It wasn't coming out with like the heavy hitting, oh, I have a thesis. But I mean, they definitely did have their um, perspective on what counts as a philosophical theme and a philosophical theme in a video game. So yeah, they had this bit here. I know you can't see behind the uh, review screen. Interactivity, replayability, and then they... The other one was the completeness or the consistency of the game world. So, like, when you're in the game world, it needs this thing. And a, a lot of people talk about uh, immersion, immersion in video games. And so, like, that's a lot of this goes to, like, what's so-called immersion, where you can be interactive and immersed in the world, and then you can come back and, like, still feel like you're in that world. So, this does have some philosophical claims i don't know exactly like i don't know enough about this but like it definitely did yeah so i'm oh, sorry you didn't get the uh small n in nog i mean if you don't want to fix it, i'll fix it later but thank you uh it all costs money for the review so what am i saying i mean i'm just gonna give it a vote man i think this was um like if you want to read it you can read it it's not that bad um vote man and let me see. Do I want to say anything else? I mean, maybe I'll just give it a minute. I can. You can always add more uh, stuff later. Um, there are. Uh, Frank says I think this is unfair to because it argued more than a paper, but still, yeah. You can. You can. You know what you could do. You can give it vote yay also. So if you give it a may and a, a meh and a yay, it puts it in between a meh and a yay. Like in my sort of like scheme for rating this. Thank you, Vipers. That was uh, very uh, informative and very helpful. Yeah, so if you give it like a vote meh and uh, one of the other ones, like yeah. I wonder why the vote meh... Oh, the... Oh, yeah, see, and that's the funny part. The Met in the Met is the uh, capital V because I was following the global emote strategy, unlike the other custom ones. So I'll fix that later if, unless you do it, um, Inspector Diameter. Your vote Met didn't go through. So it's getting like a Met and a Yay in between for me. Um, so, yeah. So there we go.